Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 15 of my beta campaign. The emphasis of this particular episode is going to be on docking. In fact, we're going to have three separate dockings in this episode. There are going to be some other missions kind of scattered in amongst that, but those missions are kind of of a type you've seen before, so we're going to skip through them quickly and just emphasize on the docking. Now the ship that you see here is the Kemenai 1, and the mission is to dock with the Kajina uh, target vehicle, the KTV, that was launched a couple of episodes ago. And at the helm, of course, we got our our best pilot at the helm of this one is Jebediah. Now I do want to talk a little bit about the structure here. What we have happening, uh, you can see that I didn't use a decoupler actually to uh, join the OMS, the orbiter, with the uh, ascent stage. Instead, I used a docking port. Um, that's because we're gonna need a docking port, and I thought putting the docking port at the back would be an efficient use of parts. Now, the one thing, though, you do have to be careful about when using docking port to connect parts together is that docking parts will tend to be a little bit flimsy. So what you do is you use struts to kind of strengthen that connection. And uh, I mentioned last time, uh, a couple episodes ago, about strutting, and about trying to create triangles and trying to put those struts on angles. So that's the purpose of the hard points that you see here. Those hard points are designed to sort of bring the struts out to kind of create that triangle shape. It makes that connection a lot more stiff. So while we're time warping to our transfer burn, let's take a look at this vessel. This vessel runs purely on monopropellant. Uh, it has one monoprop tank, that's that small yellow tank that the solar panels are attached to, and that is, oh, and I guess it's got some monoprop in the command capsule as well, and that is all the monoprop that it has. And uh, that's all the fuel it has, period. That's all it runs on. And even with just that, that gives it 465 meters per second of delta V. It is a very, very very light vehicle um, and you can see that I'm using the uh, monoprop radial engines mounted there towards the back and that allowed me to put that docking port on the back which I thought worked really well with the small capsule so that I can still have a parachute up at the front this is also my first spacecraft to use reaction control system uh, the RCS thrusters that you see kind of in around where the decoupler is between the capsule and the command and the uh, service module. Um, as far as placement of those things go, what you generally want to do is actually get them far away from the center of mass, um, towards the front and towards the back as much as you can. The more you can get them away from the center of mass, the more torque they put on the vessel, and the more uh, effect they have. But because this thing is so light, I didn't want to cover this thing full of RCS thrusters. So the alternative is is to actually put them close to the center of mass. So these are actually very close to the center of mass of it, but are obviously outwards, right, on the outer part of the vessel. I didn't want to put them on the narrow sort of neck part of the vessel, but on the outside part of the vessel, so they still generate some torque. But what they do if they're close or kind of right on top of the center of mass like these guys are, is when I want to move laterally, as I will be doing when I'm docking, um, it doesn't induce any torque and I can keep the ship still flying straight. Gemini, of course, is in reference to the American Gemini missions, and I hope that it goes without saying that I am in no way trying to actually create a Gemini capsule here. Um, I know that there are people out there that, that really enjoy and do actually fantastic jobs uh, emulating the look and function of actual historical spacecraft and in fact you can get mods that do the same things as well and I am not trying to do that here so please don't leave any comments of the oh my god I've seen much much better Gemini capsules than this uh, yeah th th I'm not trying to make this look like a Gemini capsule so at all you don't need to see me do another rendezvous so I'm gonna cut straight to the docking and right off the bat you can see that uh, uh, a new window has popped up. That pops up automatically as soon as uh, it sees some docking ports that might want to dock together, and that is the uh, docking alignment indicator. And I'm going to talk about that very, very soon, but we're going to have lots of opportunity to talk about docking. Remember, there's two more dockings coming after this, and I'll do one of them without the indicator so that if you're playing just with the stock docking, uh, you'll get some tips with that as well, because I do know that a number of people... Um, do find docking frustrating. I don't, I don't, I, you know, but for me, I love docking. Docking is one of my absolute favorite things to do. So, 
Um, and also, some people might have been mentioning or noticing. Uh, boy, Aben, you were doing a lot of time warping back there, and if you take a look at the time, you'll see that I'm now over two hours into this mission. Um, yeah, when I when I did my ascent, I actually messed it up a little bit. I uh, I, I wasn't far enough ahead of the KTV, the rendezvous vehicle that I wanted to meet up with, so I had to do a few orbits with Jebediah to uh, to catch back up to it again, to come all the way around and catch back up to it again. So uh, yeah, Gemini has been in this capsule now for a little while. Anyway, let's talk about docking. So first thing you want to do is you want to select the the uh, docking port and control it from there. You want to control from the docking port. And let's talk about the docking alignment indicator. So the orange arrow that you see there, now it's become that, that orange crosshair. Um, that indicates the plane of your docking port relative to the docking port you have selected to go to. So you want to put that at the uh, center of the white crosshairs. So that's indicating to you that now the two uh, docking ports are flush. They are pointing in this opposite directions in fact. The other, now the green crosshair that you see now moving upwards, that's the axes of the two docking ports and you also want to have that come up to uh, the white one, but you can't get that there right yet. And finally, the yellow icon is, as you're used to, the uh, prograde vector. Now, um, I got a little bit messed up. I actually had my fingers in the wrong spot, so I got a little bit discombobulated, and I pushed the M button and went to map view and all that kind of stuff, so I had to get myself under some control here a little bit and look at where my fingers are, and I finally did do all that. And so you want to get the green cross onto the white crosshair, you want to get the yellow onto the white crosshair, and then uh, finally now you can see here I got everything lined up. You can see it's lined up there perfectly and all I got to do is wait for it to go in there and there we go. Now I know that went pretty quickly so I'll talk about it in more detail on a later docking mission in this same video. But well, this completed this contract so why don't we take a look at what we get here with the contract. So this is the Agena Target Vehicle Orbital Test Around Kerbin Dock with ATV Kajerna target vehicle. You have been successful with launching an Agena type craft, docking with it, changing your orbital altitude. Congratulations! The first ATV was launched on December 25th, 1965, while Gemini 6 astronauts were waiting on the pad. While the Atlas performed normally, the Agena's engine exploded during orbital injection. Since the rendezvous and docking was the primary objective, the Gemini 6 mission was scrubbed and replaced with an alternate mission, Gemini 6A, which rendezvous but could not dock with the Gemini 7 in December. Of course, we had no trouble with exploding engines or anything like that. We got our docking in here successful. So Jeb's going to go out, do an EVA, and take a look at our creation. And even with simple crafts like this, I don't know, once you get them put together, I find them always kind of interesting to take a look at. So we'll just do a little fly around the vessel, and then it's time to get back in and think about getting Jeb on in home. So we'll detach and we'll say goodbye to the uh, KTV, at least for now. I'm not sure if I'll come back up here again, but one never knows. And after our deorbit burn and a little bit of traveling through the atmosphere, we had a little trouble putting Jeb down into the water off of the coast of the KSC. And right after pulling Jeb out of the water, I went and stuck him into the Aristarchus. Uh, yeah, this is literally minutes later. This was right after this mission. Um, I think I just lost track of who the pilot was and didn't realize it was still Jeb. But, but nevertheless, this was one of those, um, you know, aerial pressure scan missions that are pretty easy to do and went, went without incident. Though I do think that uh, Jeb is perhaps still a little bit loopy from his, his uh, space travels and and ended up taking a more aggressive turn than normal when the mission was finished and it was time to head back home. And now we'll take a very quick look at a further mission. This is MAPSAT-3, and MAPSAT-3 is being inserted into a polar orbit about the moon. And, uh, yeah, this is a MAPSAT mission with some ScanSat tools and some Carbonite tools on it that's going to scan the moon for me 
and uh, look for resources and also give us a bio map that we'll be looking at lately. But you've seen me do this around Kerbin. It is the same deal just around the moon, so I don't think we need to spend any more time uh, than we already have on this. But now we will move on to something new. Here we have Bob, and Bob is driving the Alhazen. And as you can see here, that the Alhazen is, well, for all intents and purposes, a car, a science buggy, if you will. And uh, the purpose of this particular mission, there's no contract associated with this, is just to go around uh, KSC to all the various different little regions that exist because you can go to all the different buildings, lots of different areas, and collect science there. And um, the great thing about the Alhazen is that this is completely an electric vehicle. So if I bring it back to the runway, I will get 100% cost back. I didn't even spend any money on fuel. So this is a completely free mission. So we're going to go around and we're going to go and collect us some science. Now, the inline Mark I cockpit uh, with the stock doesn't have... Um, an interior view but somebody has put out a mod that does add this beautiful interior view with again some of these raster prop monitors on here uh, I've mounted an external camera you might notice it in case Bob is having any trouble whatsoever looking out the window but uh, yeah we'll drive along here and then unfortunately though uh, yeah we got this thing stuck and no matter what I did, I couldn't shake it. So there was nothing left to it. Bob had to go out and push and hopefully dislodge this thing so we can get around to other uh, parts, other biomes within the KSC. And pushing from the back, you can see, didn't end up working out. So we pushed it from the front. And, well, yeah, this turns into a bit of a comedy here because... Uh, it seems to be getting away on Bob. Bob. It's going faster than Bob can run, so uh, hopefully this will get uh, stuck somewhere pretty soon, maybe when it hits the runway. And thankfully that lip up on the runway does slow it down, so Bob is able to catch up to it and clamber on up aboard and get this thing under control. Other than that Keystone Cop type moment, uh, the rest of this mission went without a hitch. Uh, and it was just a matter of going to each of the various buildings. Each of them is their own biome, collecting the science that you can find there. And uh, don't forget to do things like the launch pad, the crawlway out to the launch pad, the runway. Um, those are also all biomes. And as well, I made my way out to the shores, which is just a little bit north and uh, east of the KSC and got the some surface science out of that one and while Bob is diligently collecting science at eight times speed why don't we talk about the person this vessel is named after namely Al Hazen. Uh, Al Hazen was a 10th century Arabic mathematician and physicist and I think I can feel comfortable using the word physicist now. And something that's often forgotten in the Western world is, you know, when the Roman Empire fell, or at least the Western part of the Roman Empire fell, and we went into what is commonly referred to as the Dark Ages, um, it's not like the entire world went into the Dark Ages, just sort of the European part of it did. And in fact, um, the Eastern part of the Roman Empire survived for some time, and the knowledge that was collected and acquired by the, the Greeks and the Romans passed on into the Arabic world and they basically picked up where the Greeks and the Romans left off and continued on and completely blissfully unaware to the Europeans uh, until, until the two worlds began to collide rather tragically uh, many centuries later. But, but Alhazen um, or Al Hazen, I keep saying that, I don't know why I'm stuck on that, but Al Hazen many, made many contributions to physics and astronomy and mathematics, but I kind of want to focus on his main contribution, which is a book on optics, which played no small influence on later astronomical telescopes. And it was read, and he, he was read by and greatly influenced uh, the likes of people like Galileo and Kristen Huygens and Johannes Kepler. Um, and his method of research was based upon experimentation and controlled testing and really was a precursor to what we would call now the scientific method. And yeah, his, his influence on what became sort of European, what we think of as European science and the scientific revolution really cannot be understated. 
And this little bit of running around uh, ended up generating 195.3 science, which is certainly nothing to sneeze at. Moving along, we come to Manuki in the air. Starkus once again performing pressure scans. Uh, this is another mission that we won't spend a lot of time with because things go along pretty well, except to note that this landing that we're supposed to be doing in Kerbinot's periphery sure seems a little bit sketchy. That looks like some pretty rough highlands there below me, but, well, we've done so many landings in this craft in sketchy terrain that it almost is becoming routine, but I do want to stay keep saying the word almost because the moment I think it is routine is the moment where things aren't going to go so well. And now we move on to the final mission of this episode. As you can see from this, we have broken into the 2.5 meter parts. This is our largest vessel yet, weighing in at over 65 tons. This is the Kuryuz-1. And the mission is to eventually get these three Kerbinots, our pilot uh, Tom Plock, our scientist Rod Bart, and our engineer Bill up to the Hipparchus Space Station, which was launched 20 days ago. But you might recall from two episodes ago that the Hipparchus Station, um, the transfer vehicle for that station, um, well, I never in raised its antenna, and it was left dead in space and drifting away from Hipparchus. And over the past 20 days, it has actually moved a respectable distance away from Hipparchus. So the first mission is actually going to be to revive that uh, transfer vehicle so that it can be deorbited. Now some of you are likely noticing a bit of a strange construction in this 2.5 meter lifter and that is that the upper part of it is actually only 1.25 meters in diameter and that was in order to allow me to recess the radial parachutes. I do want to recover this stage like I do with all my stages to get some money back. Um, but these two, these heavy 2.5 meter parts come in with quite a bit more force uh, than the lighter stages do. And if I have those radial parachutes on the outside of the stage, they will end up likely burning off thanks to deadly re-entry. So this uh, recession sort of saves them for me, though it does give this rocket a bit of a wobbly ascent, despite the extra strutting that I threw in there. And we'll cut straight to the rendezvous with the transfer vehicle. Um, all I want to do here is actually uh, park on beside it. So I'm just approaching in really, really slowly. And then I'm going to bring the vessel to a stop. And we'll get one of our Kerbinots here. I ended up selecting uh, Tomplock more or less just at random. Actually, now I'm thinking about it. I probably should have just sent out Bill. After all, he is the engineer. But we got Tomplock out now. And Tomplock's going to go out there and just revive that antenna. Um, and extend it out there so that this thing can come back to life. And as Tom Plock makes his way back, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing next, which is to dock the Kuryus with this particular vessel. Um, and what we're going to be doing is just stealing whatever fuel we can from it. You know, we might as well not let it go to waste. And we're going to use that opportunity to talk about docking a little bit, and this time I'm not going to use the docking alignment indicator that you saw at the front of the video. I'm going to do this using the stock tools. Now there's a couple of things to realize. The first of which is that the stock docking UI really is a very little help and I would recommend simply not using it at all and just docking using the nav ball. Now a couple of tips. The toughest part is to get the planes of the two docking ports to be parallel, but that can be simply solved by turning both docking ports so that they face along the normal vector. Take one of the vehicles and point it along one of the normal vectors and then take the other vehicle and point it along the opposite normal vector. The reason why this helps is because as objects orbit, the direction of the normal vectors in space don't change. That's not true for the prograde vectors or for the radial vectors, but it is true for the normal vector. So by turning one normal and then turning the other one anti-normal, and in this case because we're on an equatorial orbit, that means turning one north and turning one south, um, that takes care of one thing. It gets the two docking ports to be exactly parallel to each other. Now with that problem solved, uh, we 
control from the docking port of the vessel that we're flying and we select the other docking port as our target and then we use the target indicator on the nav ball that's that purple icon as our alignment indicator as that moves uh, towards the center of the nav ball we are getting closer and closer to being lined up and when that purple icon is exactly in the center of the nav ball then we are lined up perfectly. So we use you know, our maneuvering thrusters to get us there. What also helps is seeing the prograde uh, icon coming up because you want to line that up. You want to line up the purple icon, the yellow icon, and the center of the nav ball to get them all in a row and that has you moving um, that has you moving in the direction that you want to go. Unfortunately I'm going so slow here that I often end up losing that prograde vector. But once I have the target icon in the center of the nav ball it's simply a matter of thrusting a bit forward I, I'm pretty slow and meticulous with this you can go faster than what I'm doing and uh, thrusting your way forward using that H button uh, and uh, just pushing your vehicle until they dock now I ended up using the remote tech flight computer to get the target vehicle to hold onto its vector. That's why it did that flip once the two vessels came back together again. Um, if I left the target vehicle, uh, it ended up not being able to hold a vector and it would start to slowly rotate, which obviously makes dark docking a lot more challenging. And I'm curious to people, from people that are just playing pure stock, um, if they're finding that a problem, if they're finding that, you know, when you want to dock things together, if the target vehicle can't hold on to a vector, uh, that's going to be an issue and I'm wondering if that's uh, an unintended consequence of the things that they added in the beta version. Well anyway with our fuel transferred it's time to get over to the Hipparchus station but we have ourselves an interesting situation here. The Hipparchus station is in pretty much the same orbit we're in but it is about 118.6 kilometers behind us. Okay, so how are we going to get ourselves there? The um, tempting thing to do would be to simply point ourselves straight at Hipparchus Station and kind of blast our way there. But that is not the best way to do it. In fact, it is a highly inefficient way to do it. The issue is, is that Hipparchus is behind us, and so we'll burn uh, retrograde and if we burn retrograde we will be lowering our orbit and if we lower our orbit we will actually start to go faster and then we'll find ourselves actually moving further away from Hipparchus and then people will well I'll burn even faster to it and you'll end up burning you'll probably get there eventually but you'll burn a lot of fuel getting it no the way to do it is to actually turn yourself prograde and start burning the other way to raise your orbit and to slow yourself down. So yes, to get your to go backwards, you burn forwards in this particular situation. Now you can see a couple of maneuver nodes have popped up once I started to burn forward. So what you want to do is you want to continue to burn forward, watching those maneuver nodes. They're getting closer and closer together. And as soon as one of them gets down to being close to zero, you've got yourself your encounter and you did this in a very efficient way burning the minimum amount of fuel. It's then just a simple matter of waiting for just a single orbit to come around so that we come to our rendezvous. And here we are coming into our final docking of the video. So I'm back to using the docking alignment indicator. I mean, it's such a good interface. I don't know what, why I don't want to use it. So again, the first step is to get that orange target onto the white crosshairs. That aligns the planes of the two docking ports. Um, the, then you want to start moving the... Well, basically, if you see that yellow, you see that yellow prograde vector, if you keep that between the green... Uh, crosshairs and the orange uh, target, then you have the crosshairs always moving in the right direction. The other thing I want to draw attention to is that sort of orange icon towards the top of it. That's indicating rotation. Here it's not particularly important how I have the vessel rotated, but when you are doing construction in orbit, it is of 
immense value to have that rotation indicator so that you can align your parts exactly the way you want it to go. So as long as I keep that prograde vector uh, between the green cross and the center orange icon, I am working my way to the right direction and it's just a matter of time until I have my docking. Once I'm docked for a while, what I like to do too is to shut down engines and also to shut down any torque in any vessels that are not uh, part of this. So I'm going to shut down the torque in the command uh, capsule as well. Um, sometimes if you have more, too many reaction wheels all going at the same time with flimsy docking ports between them, especially if those reaction wheels are on different axes, they can start to fight each other and you can get a lot of shaking going on. But uh, all we got left to do here is to transfer uh, Tom Plock and Bill and, uh, and Rod Bart over to their new home. We'll go inside there and check out and see what they think about it. Yeah, I think they're going to like it here. They're looking pretty content. I have enough food and uh, life support to last them for about 100 days. So I think the plan is going to be to keep them up here for 50 days. And then we'll rotate the crew. And then the next time we come in and rotate the crew... Um, We'll also do a restock of, of the station. So that's going to be it for this particular video, and we hope to see you next time.